You are listening to WCAT Radio, your station for quality Catholic programming. Your selected program will begin right after a word from our sponsor, Group M7.com, a web design and hosting company. Log on to Group M7.com today and let them know that WCAT Radio sent you. You know, my finest childhood memories was the Saturday morning movies for about four bits each. My brother and I could split a Coke and a big box of popcorn and watch movies about Tarzan, Jane, and their Amazon River adventures. Well, maybe that's where Jeff Bezos took his name. His Amazon.com is now the largest online retailer in the world. I'm Michael Malfood with Group M7, the oldest and largest website design firm in East Texas. And here's my point. And as usual, it's a good one. If your website is modern and up-to-date, mobile and search engine friendly, it matters not whether you sell a product or provide information about your goods and services. Your sales justifiably will increase just like theirs. The world uses the Internet. We can improve your website and your email. Look at our giant portfolio at groupm7.com. Since 1995, there's only one web and there's only one group, and it's us. It's Group M7. You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Sebastian Mafud. I'm Vice President of External Affairs at Holy Apostles College and Seminary. Today, we have the very first session of Professor William Badke's workshop uh, entitled uh, Advanced Research Skills for Graduate Students. Uh, Before we begin, though, I'd like to ask Brother James Lindsay to lead us in an opening prayer. Brother James. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, inspire us. Love of God, consume us. Along the true road, lead us. Mary, our good mother, look down upon us. With Jesus, bless us from all evil, all illusion, all danger. Preserve us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son. Our Lady... St. Mary Magdalene, pray Pray for for us. us. One of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Thank you so very much, Brother James. You're welcome. So uh, to give a brief introduction to uh, a man who needs no introduction, uh, Professor William Badke is Associate Librarian for Associated Canadian Theological Schools and Information Literacy at Trinity Western University in Langley, British Columbia, Canada. That makes this an international class. He has taught research processes to thousands of students for more than 35 years. His extensive publications show that he does research rather than just teach it. With that, uh, and let me give you uh, Professor William Badke. Professor Badke. I probably do need some introduction. I'm not sure I'm that well known around, but uh, I have been doing this kind of work for over 35 years and uh, primarily with seminary students. And uh, not not to say anything negative about you, but you look like a pretty average seminary class. Okay, uh, that's those are the sorts of people that I work with on a daily basis and have done so for thirty five years. So uh, I don't find this at all strange. This is this is perfect, um, and uh, here we are. Uh, the The essence of the course is is research. And here I'm talking about informational research, the kind of stuff that you would do in seminary research projects, uh, papers, and uh, other kinds of of projects where you have to enlist information uh, in the task of of presenting something to a professor. And uh, I always have a question to students at the beginning, which is, why do professors assign these research projects? You've probably already experienced them lots in undergraduate and suffered through them. Uh, Some people think they're excruciatingly boring. Uh, Others think that they are just an exercise in trauma, you know, the blank screen and the, you know, how am I going to accomplish this? And even though I've done this before, I know this time it's going to sink me. I will never be able to succeed at this, Um, that kind of thing. So why do professors do it to you? Uh, I mean, why not just give you an exam at the end of the class, end of the course, and uh, see what you know and uh, send you on your way and uh, not make you do these these terrible projects? Any ideas? Uh, 
let me suggest one, your professors are all sadistic. They, they love to see their students suffer. Their students make them suffer enough that, uh, boy, it's just a great opportunity. Anything else? Any other ideas? Christina, I think you were going to yes, say. Uh, it came, uh, I, I've been through several uh, jobs, and uh, it came to be useful to be able to do good research. I think that's where uh, most of uh, the usefulness of what my work was about uh, came to be is uh, either doing some legal research or doing uh, scientific research, trying to build up uh, a laboratory uh, for a diagnostics company, and uh, also um, doing research that was relevant to the uh, Catholic perspective. I had to um, basically defend uh, a policy at one of my jobs um, that would protect um, uh, fetal remains and um, de destined them for burial. So I had to go and work with NCBC and uh, put something together for my company that would be uh, comprehensible and civil. So it's definitely useful for uh, real life situations. You know, what's great about your response is that you are using process thinking rather than just content thinking. You're saying this is useful to accomplish something, uh, to get something done. Uh, and uh, uh, a standard response I get from a lot of students is uh, something like, the professor wants me to study something uh, in a little more depth than we can cover in class. In other words, uh, all students should be able to dig a little more deeply into some subject matter and uh, report out what they've read. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that is not a terribly adequate kind of reason to be doing a research project. Uh, it assumes that what you are doing is digging up content for the professor. As uh, in, uh, dear professor so-and-so, uh, I have uh, read up on this topic. I have studied lots of sources. Here they are in my bibliography. And this is what I learned about the topic. And it becomes a reading report. It becomes, uh, you know, I, I have compiled and summarized this stuff. And here we are. And it really focuses on content rather than process. Okay, let me suggest a good reason for assigning a research project. Because the professor wants you to engage in problem solving. What do I mean by that? The professor wants you to attack some difficulty, challenge, open question, whatever, in the subject matter that you're dealing with, and wants you to grapple with that uh, use information in order to uh, look at the various points of view, the various options that are available by way of a solution to the problem. And then wants you to come back, having grappled with everything, with some measure of problem solving. Uh, now you might say, well, what sort of problem solving are we looking at here? And it could be any number of things. Uh, it's generally something where there's a gap in our knowledge or whether there's, where there's controversy about, uh, you know, what we should be saying about this. And uh, if, if none of you have seen controversy lately, you haven't been looking at the political sphere or the social sphere, uh, you know, the vaxxers and the anti-vaxxers and all of those. Those are all examples of problems that need to be addressed. And uh, so research is really, at its best, not content sourced, but problem sourced. And that's what Christina was getting at. She's grappling with problems. She uses information to try to solve those problems and come up with solutions. And uh, so as we're going to be looking at research, we need to be thinking in those terms. Now, a lot of students um, have a pretty strong idea of how competent they are in research. And, uh, the, you know, students have been researched about their research ability. Uh, everything gets researched. And uh, the, the interesting fact is that when you ask the average graduate students, student, how, how good are you at, at doing research? They generally say, well, I learned a lot in my undergraduate. I'm pretty competent. And uh, then they are tested on their research ability. And while they might score 80% on what they believe their research ability to be, they tend to score about 30% on their actual research ability. In other words, they tend to gravely overestimate how well they are actually doing effective research. And you might say, well, why would that be? And I think it's because 
uh, there is not a really strong perception among students in general uh, as to what could be learned, what could be known in order to improve their skills. And uh, so that's what I really want to grapple with uh, through these four sessions. Now, four sessions isn't nearly enough to make you an expert researcher, but it is enough to introduce some concepts that you could follow up with. And uh, I have a textbook which uh, is listed in the platform there, and um, uh, it's available very cheaply. Uh, there it is, Research Strategies. If you want to get an electric, electronic copy, uh, you can get one for like under 10 bucks. So uh, it's not, not expensive. Uh, and if you've got a print copy, uh, all the better. You know, you can kind of wrestle with it and dog ear it and write in it and whatever you want to do. Uh, but I want to take a look at four basic concepts of research that can help you to ramp up from wherever you are uh, to actually developing some strong expertise in the whole field of research. Uh, the first of these, and the one we want to look at today, has to do with the information landscape. Now, you might say, well, what is that? Uh, it's not how to search databases. We'll look at that a little later, and there's some advanced features in databases that you can really make use of, but it's the world of information. Uh, back in, in 1989 or so, um, the powers that be in the scientific and technological world unleashed a whirlwind. They didn't think they were doing so, but they did. It was called the World Wide Web. And what it did was to ensure that virtually anyone with a web connection could get access to just about any piece of information that they wanted. And, uh, you know, wonder wonderful for democracy. You know, when you think of the Arab Spring in uh, the, uh, you know, 2010, 2011, uh, that was fueled primarily by the Internet, by people through social media and other contacts and email and videos and whatever, uh, getting in touch with one another, gathering together and rising up against oppressors. And uh, the people who created the World Wide Web looked at that and said, this is wonderful. This is the greatest avenue for free speech that the world has ever known, ever. It's also uh, the greatest library, the greatest information source that anyone has ever known. But it unleashed a whirlwind because even though advanced scholars can publish on the net, so can your uncle Fred who lives up in the attic and has these really strange ideas and wants to publish them all. And he tweets and he uses Facebook and he does blogs and it's all nonsense or it's dangerous. Uh, and uh, we know what's happening with Facebook and Twitter these days and dangerous lies that are getting out there and, and essentially getting people killed because people will follow this stuff and die. And uh, so the, the whole thing with the net is that they fail to recognize as they were developing this thing uh, the reality of something that you should know very well, not personally, but you should know theologically, which is human depravity. You know, the fact that human beings will take things that are good and turn them into monstrosities. Uh, we've, we, I mean, we see it all the time. Uh, in every avenue of life, there were good things that happen, and then people take the good things and turn them into monstrosities. And so we have released this world uh, on the on everyone, and it is filled with a very spotty, uneven information field. And now we have the question, how do we grapple with all of that in order to find sound information, uh, in order to find scholarly information, uh, and, you know, even defining scholarly can sometimes be a problem. How do we uh, sort of throw out the dregs of everything that we're being having thrown at us and actually make sense of our information landscape in such a way that we can really deal with it. And I've got some presentations that I want to show you, uh, a couple of them, uh, and I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, so I always end up on the Zoom thing, so I'll just go into the Zoom thing, and then I'll go over. I've got a, um, come on, there is my thing. Okay. Uh, this is the platform that you folks have been given, and I'm just going to minimize your faces for a minute. Uh, if you have questions as we go along, uh, be sure to ask them. 
Uh, but I want to take a look at four things, information landscape, research design, how do you set up your research for success, search strategies, which is uh, getting into advanced databases, and then how do you organize your stuff in order to make it, sh make it work. And uh, so we're going to take a look at research design today. And uh, I want to immediately go into a presentation here. And uh, let me just get this into full screen. Can everybody see that? Somebody uh, unmute yourself and say, yes, I can see it. Is it visible? Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Yes, it is. yes sir. Is there? Okay. So uh, let's go. Now, research needs a goal. Uh, if you just write about a topic, excuse me a second, I'm just going to go back here for a minute. Um, I think I'm in the wrong. Yes, it's this presentation that I want. That one's coming. You'll get it. So let's present. I spent 39 days in the hospital, as you're going to uh, kind of excuse me if my, I'm a little daughtery, but I'm, uh, I'm really not. Uh, disable high floating controls. Okay. 50 years ago, we had a pretty clear idea of what we meant by information. It was, it was a pretty limited idea, but it was a pretty good idea. Information was controlled by gatekeepers. This is really important. Uh, the concept of the gatekeeper is, is crucial to understanding the information landscape. Uh, information was scarce and costly. If you publish something, you had to print it. You had to distribute it. Uh, it didn't, it didn't come cheaply. And so, there were gatekeepers, people in the publishing industry who determined whether something would be published or not. They were gatekeepers in that sense. Uh, they would either accept something or they wouldn't. Uh, for the most part, there were books and then there were journals and magazines. And uh, that was pretty it, pretty well it. I mean, you had pamphlets and, and newspapers and things like that, but uh, everything came at a cost. Uh, a publisher had to put out good money and then charge you money to get back the, the money that they had and have the profits. And so you could be very sure that they didn't publish everything. They published what they thought would be practical for their purposes and what would sell. The amount of information available in the world was limited, but quality was controlled. So information scarcity was a reality of life uh, right up into the 1980s. Um, you know, every time you buy textbooks, you think, uh, you know, I, I can buy three of these, but I can't afford the other ones. And uh, so there was, there was a lot of question about how much stuff you would have. If you go back into the time of uh, the church fathers and, uh, and those figures, they had access to scrolls that existed in one place in the entire world. Or if you were lucky, there were three copies or something like that. You had to travel to your information source and uh, read it there. And uh, so quality was controlled, but very little was available. So along comes the internet, or more specifically, the World Wide Web, which opened up the internet to the world. Uh, suddenly, Google rules. Uh, Google, you know, where did it come from? It just suddenly took over. And there it is. We're in a Google world. Now you can find whatever information your heart desires, just Google it. But here's the problem. How do we know anything we find is real information? Here are some things I, I pulled off the net. U.S. planned 911 attacks to attack Middle East. Uh, 911 was a plot of the U.S. government. Uh, they wanted to attack the Middle East. They needed an excuse. And so they um, you know, bombed the towers. And uh, that was their excuse to move in and attack the Middle East. Combination of shrimp and vitamin C tablets creates arsenic poisoning. Interesting. How to hide your guns. There's a good one. Uh, paranoia personified. They're coming for your guns. Here's how to hide them from wherever. And uh, I like this one, KFC mutant chickens. Uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken a while back started calling itself KFC. And uh, so the word went out that this happened because uh, Kentucky Fried had begun using mutant chickens that weren't real chicken. Uh, they were mutated in some way or other. 
uh, maybe to increase their size or whatever. And the government had decreed that they could no longer call themselves Kentucky Fried Chicken because it wasn't really chicken. And so now they call themselves KFC and they sell you mutant chicken sandwiches. Now, before I get attacked by KFC, none of these are remotely true, but there they are on the net. And right now we know all the stuff having to do with vaccinations and other kinds of plots against us. I'm not putting down the net, but you'll, because you will find a lot of good information there, but you really have great trouble sometimes discerning real information from what is trash or deception. Anyone can post just about anything and it's no time to tell lies on the World Wide Web or social media. So real challenge, never in human history has so much information or knowledge been avail made available to us without gatekeepers to tell us what will get published and what won't, but without gatekeepers simply knowing what is true information, that is what actually informs us, that's what I mean by true information, and what is hokum presents a really serious problem for us. In the academic world, here's some questions. Can I use Wikipedia? It's on the net, it's kind of dubious. Uh, what websites will a professor accept? If I find something on the, on the web, uh, how do I know a professor will want me to cite it? What books and journal articles can I find with Google? Uh, what, academic, what do academic sources mean for a research paper? Uh, your professor says, I want only academic sources. Well, what exactly does that entail? Um, my prof wants peer-reviewed literature. What does that mean? What's a preprint? I came across something said it was a preprint. Uh, is it peer reviewed? Uh, do I have to use academic databases? Why can't I just use Google? It's much easier. It's not an either or situation. Google can help a lot, but there's still a place for gatekeeping. There's a place for databases that are more sophisticated than Google where gatekeeping still happens in a very definite way. Skill with Google does not create a researcher. And uh, just when you're feeling so confident, sorry about that, and there it is. In a world in which information is abundant but our, but our uncertainty about its quality is growing, we need sophisticated skills to find and evaluate the best information resources. Okay. Now, I, I wanna look a little further down in this platform. Uh, I'm going to leave this for you, understanding scholarship in the information age. There's some information here about how you can figure out uh, a discipline, a new discipline you're working in. You're in a theology course or whatever. Uh, how do scholars operate within that discipline? What are the things that they are looking for? Uh, how do they understand their world and their methods and their thought processes so that you can in some way emulate that? And I'll leave that to you. Uh, I want to take a look briefly at this. This is a little longer than I would like, so I'm going to just cut back on it a little bit. Uh, this is a presentation I put together called What is Scholarship? Let me give you a definition. Scholarship is all about a profound discontent, about a quest to discover more, about a burning desire to solve society's problems and make a better world. Now, that's pretty high-blown. Uh, I created that definition, so I, I guess I can be as high-blown as I want. Uh, but it's about reaching out beyond what is here to solve problems, to make a better world, to advance our understanding in the, and uh, really a, a sense of discovery throughout. So uh, I get this from Association of College and Research Libraries. I didn't, they didn't create this whole thing. They created some of the central principles. The first principle, authority is constructed and contextual. I want to explain this a little bit. Um, we all know the term authority. Uh, authority is essentially uh, that which we rely upon, that which tells us what to do, what to believe. Uh, authority is the kind of thing that you grew up with your parents with or your teachers or your professors where they say certain things and you accept certain things uh, because they are the authorities and you are not. And uh, so it has to do with a measure of their reliability, their trustworthiness, and uh, the fact that what they have to say to you is valuable and useful for you. Uh, now, the first principle is that authority is really constructed and contextual. Uh, what do I mean by that? 
I mean that authority isn't really authority in practice until you, the receiver of that authority, accept it, that authority. In other words, uh, you can just as easily defy your professor and say, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm walking out. Uh, you can defy uh, a police officer. Uh, now, there may be consequences, but you kind of determine whether you're going to accept authority or not. And authority is also contextual. Uh, somebody might have great authority in one aspect of your life and no authority in another. And uh, so, uh, you know, your professor has authority in the classroom, but has no authority to arrest you and put you in jail. Uh, it's contextual. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, information comes out of a context, someone created it, and it lives in a context, which is your context. And so there's, there's kind of this, these two aspects. The author, uh, what is their claim to being uh, reliable, to being an official, to being having a role that you would trust? And then you are the receiver. Do I receive? Do I believe this? Would I rely on this? Why or why not? Uh, as theology students, we probably have some aspects of authority uh, that are, you know, much more authoritative when we talk about uh, the, the scriptures and when we talk about, you know, the authority of God. Uh, that's supposed to be absolute for us. But many aspects of authority in our lives, especially the, the authors that we read and that sort of thing, are open to a little bit of question. So it's in the eye of the receiver. If you don't accept information as reliable or necessary, it loses its authority. So we have to make decisions about whether we accept the authority of what we're getting. And it has to be sound reasons. Opinion is not a good reason. You know, I didn't like what you said, so I'm not going to accept it. Uh, doesn't work. Why didn't you like what I said? Why don't you accept it? Okay, information creation as a process. Uh, information doesn't suddenly pop into the world full blown. It goes through a process and how it's created has a lot to say about its quality. Uh, if I dash something off in 10 minutes and put it out on the net, uh, you can say, well, there you go. You know, uh, something you dashed off in 10 minutes, put out on the net. The quality is suspect. If I spent two years working on this paper and it went through a peer review process and uh, it was evaluated and it was revised and updated, it finally came out, and uh, I'm going to admit to you, uh, when it, so uh, it was finally accepted, and you can say, well, there's probably some good quality there. Uh, so it has its own history of development. So does it come out of solid research? What were the processes that it went through to get to me? And that has a lot to do with how well you're going to judge it to be scholarly. Uh, just because it's ugly, like an ugly website, doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, by the way. Information has value. Uh, now, what do I mean to a value? But there are lots of ways we can assess value. Uh, as a commodity to buy or sell, we buy or sell information every time we buy a textbook, you know, uh, bookstores sell stuff. Um, we, uh, it, it has value as a means of education. Uh, we uh, use it you're using information as a means of education right now. Uh, as a means of influencing people, we use persuasion. Information persuades, we bring evidence to bear, etc. And as a means ultimately to bring progress, we want to advance our world through information. All of those things have value or give value to information. So commercial value, uh, a lot of stuff still is too expensive to get your hands on. Uh, there's an open access movement that's trying to publish things for free, but a lot of academic books are $150 to $400 each, uh, just way too high. And uh, so uh, uh, even still, uh, the author has the right to control the copyright. You don't have the right to steal it, even if it is too expensive to own. Uh, as a means of education, you've got libraries, textbooks, internet, position paper, scientific studies, we educate ourselves all the time with information. Um, every su subject discipline has a significant knowledge base that develops, and all of that is based on information. Okay, fourth principle, research as inquiry. Very important. No research project has value if it simply discovers what's already known. 
uh, research is at its heart a quest, an inquiry, a problem-solving task. So research is a discovery kind of thing. It's a quest. It's trying to advance our knowledge. It's not trying to compile our knowledge. It's trying to move beyond that to take what we know and move us into a realm where we have greater understanding of something. It's more than summarizing facts. So you need to start with a question or a thesis. A thesis is an initial answer to a question, I believe so-and-so, or a question, what is so-and-so? Uh, if you can answer the question by looking something up, it's not research. If the answer is so obvious, you can just look it up in a book, uh, then it's really not a problem. There's no problem there. Genuine research is problem solving. We'll look at this a little more uh, shortly. So it's prob sorry, sorry to do that to you. Sometimes that happened. Uh, it's problem solving seeks an answer beyond the existing facts. So here's a model for genuine research. Let's take a look at this. Genuine research begins with a question or a thesis or something that needs to be addressed. Uh, so you throw at the question uh, a need for data and you gather data and you synthesize it. So you're gathering data related to the question. You're trying to find out what evidence there is uh, for and against uh, evidence that might support an answer to the question. You analyze that data after you've synthesized it, after you kind of put it together and mold it over. Uh, you analyze it in light of the question. So now you look at what's relevant, what's not. Uh, you may group the data into various points of view, whatever. Uh, that ends up being information, which is the kind of stuff that you can now use to make conclusions or recommendations. Uh, this model might look a little familiar. Uh, it's, it's really the same thing as the scientific research model, uh, where you start with a hypothesis, uh, you gather data, you analyze the data, you make sense of what you found, and then you make conclusions or recommendations. It's the same thing. And so whether it's uh, informational research or scientific research, it's really the same model. It's a research model. So here's some examples of uh, research questions. What's the most effective way to combat climate change regulation or carbon taxes? This is a big debate right now. And uh, there's two options I want to present. Uh, which is which is more effective? And by way of effective, I presume you mean that it actually combats climate change uh, in a way that uh, doesn't you know break everyone. Uh, is global free trade actually of economic be benefit for the poorest producers of goods? We always hear free trade, free trade, and help everyone. Uh, what about the people in the factories and in the fields? Uh, <clears throat> the poorest people who actually produce our goods are they benefiting from global free trade? And here's one, to what extent is the movie The Da Vinci Code an accurate depiction of history? There's a problem. Uh, some people say, oh, you know, this is a, a great find. And other people are saying, <coughs> certainly not. It's nowhere near being an accurate depiction of history. Well, bring evidence to bear and find an answer. All such questions demand a lot of analysis on your part to answer. And this is the key, if, if it's research, it's going to require analysis. You're not going to find the answer in a box or on a shelf. You're going to find it by digging and puzzling. Okay, fifth principles, scholarship is conversation. This one's really important as well. It has a lot to do with what scholars do. Scholars don't work in isolation. They don't all sit in their little offices or their labs or whatever and never talk to anybody. Uh, they live in a community of other scholars, and scholars are well aware of their community. Uh, one scholar publishes research, and other scholars discuss it, evaluate it, even criticize it. So that there's a lot of back and forth. Part of this is the peer review process where you submit a manuscript to a journal, and uh, they farm it out to other scholars who evaluate it, uh, review it, uh, critique it, and then it goes back to the author for revisions, and so on. Uh, all of this generates a history of discussions in print or in person. It could be at a conference, you know, you're discussing somebody's findings, but it amounts to a conversation. Scholars discuss one another's work. And uh, it's the kind of principle of iron sharpens iron. When you interact with other people over your research findings, you improve your research findings, or maybe even find out that uh, they, they aren't going to stand the test of time. They're going to fall by the wayside. So here's an image of the conversation. 
So imagine uh, Smith is arguing this. Johnson sees some value dotted line, but actually agrees more with Jones. Jones disagrees with Smith totally. And imagine these scholars are sitting in a room with you and they're debating and you're watching and listening. And eventually you make sense of it all and you make a judgment as to who you think is more likely to be credible. And so you in the role of scholarship as a conversation are kind of the final word. When you do a research project, you're the one who decides who is believable over here, whose evidence works and who does not. It's important, it helps to improve quality. Uh, findings are retested, views are challenged, evidence is checked, rightly important. You know, we have so many novel research findings that turn out not to be so novel and not to be so useful when other people test what's been done. Leads to advances in solving research problems. Uh, so uh, people get bright ideas when you're uh, evaluating other people's work and somebody adds this and someone says, hey, what about that? and you, you make advances. And it gives strength to disciplines by solidifying their knowledge base as reliable. Knowledge bases have to be tested. Your knowledge has to be tested. And uh, that's why new novel research you have to take with a bit of a grain of salt till somebody else uh, has, a, has a weigh in on it and really decides whether it's useful. So scholars converse through publications, conferences, uh, academic and professional social media. There's a lot of academic social media out there as well. Searching as strategic exploration. When you search for information, you need planning and strategy at every stage. Uh, it's, it's vitally important. Uh, some researchers uh, make errors. They think that th they're searching for the topic rather than seeking results to deal with their question. So instead of looking at, uh, you know, whether carbon credits or regulation are the best for climate change, they search on climate change and they don't get anything that's valuable. Uh, they assume that once they've searched, they have to live with their results. This is the Google problem. You know, they search Google. This is what I found. I guess that's all that's there. Uh, you don't have to live with your results. There are strategic ways to use advanced features in databases to get down to what you actually need rather than uh, just leaving it with a, a big bunch of undefined uh, results. Today's academic databases uh, can, can enable you to uh, focus on uh, particular issues. Uh, there are often subject headings and things like that to decide that can limit down what you're looking for uh, to cut down the number of results, but make them much more relevant. It's rarely a one-step process. When you start to use advanced uh, academic search engines, you're gonna find that there are several steps to follow. Uh, you do an initial Google-like search, but then you look through your results and you use advanced features and strategy is, is key in all of this. So information is constructed and contextual. Information creation as a process has value, inquiry, conversation, and strategic exploration. Now, why in the world would I go through all of this? And the reason is that we have to start understanding what is scholarly and what is not. Scholarly means it's gone through a process. It's been evaluated. It's at least been peer reviewed. In other words, there is gatekeeping involved. And so most websites don't have anybody who's checking them out, who's helping to make sense of, uh, you know, whether the stuff is good or not. And uh, so it's, it's very spotty on the web. Uh, good scholarship has to go through some kind of testing process before it reaches you. Now, what's wrong with Google? I'll just point out some things. Now, I use Google every day. I use Google for all kinds of things. But for academic literature, it's really not that helpful. Uh, first of all, only about 20% of all academic literature is available open access. That means without having to pay for it. You click on it, you get the whole article or the whole book or whatever. So this means that 80% of all academic literature won't come up as freely available full text in a Google search. And the reason for this uh, is fairly obvious, it has to do with money. Publishers of academic literature make a good deal of money, far too much money as far as I'm concerned. They make a good deal of money uh, by uh, publishing uh, their stuff and getting you to pay for it. They're not going to put it up for free in, on Google. Without any gatekeepers as well, Google results aren't really screened for quality in the same way. 
Uh, so they could appear to be academic, but have deep flaws in them that weren't caught when there was no peer review. Uh, so things go up. They look scholarly, but they may have serious flaws. Searching through a mess of go mass of Google results for the few gems that'll meet your research goals is time consuming. It's not the most effective way. Uh, we do an experiment with some of our undergraduate students where one of the librarians uh, searches for a, uh, a thing on, uh, you know, the plight of the polar bears in climate change, and they have to find five scholarly articles from the past five years. And uh, so uh, one person searches Google, and they muddle around for 10 minutes, and they come up with uh, maybe one article that isn't the, in the last five years. And uh, then I go to a, uh, a database like Academic Search, and within five minutes, I have five scholarly up-to-date articles on the plight of the polar bear and climate change. And it's, it's just much more efficient. It's much faster. And so Google is not really a profoundly good way to go when you're doing research. Something else that's coming up much more is something called preprints. Uh, scholars are very impatient about getting their publications out. And uh, if any of you have watched Big Bang Theory, there's this grand mythology. I wrote this article last week and it's already published in journal of whatever. Doesn't happen. Uh, generally, it takes up to two years to get a journal article published. And uh, to, in today's uh, rapid pace uh, of life, a lot of scholars are very impatient with that. And so there are preprint sites on the internet where you can write your manuscript uh, you can get it up as far as you want in quality, and you post it in the preprint site. And it's up there on the net. Anyone can see it. It gets put, picked up by news reports. So Associated Press picks up your article that you uh, finished last week and published today. And before you know it, it's out there on Associated Press as uh, this has not been peer reviewed, but here is what this scholar found. And it's something terrible like, uh, you know, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine doesn't work, work against the Delta variant, which is not true. But uh, there was a study recently that, that was implying that that was the case. This is a preprint, folks, and they are getting out there on the net. What is more and what is even more complicating is that Google Scholar, the grand Google academic database, picks up these preprints off these sites and puts them out along with formally peer-reviewed literature. And so always as you're doing work, especially if you're using any database other than the, you know, the, the academic library databases you have, but if you're using something like Google Scholar, watch for the term preprint. If it's there, it really hasn't been properly vetted. It's not scholarship as it should be. It's not up to par. Uh, the other problem, I get this all the time from students, it looked academic to me. It had notes, it had a bibliography, uh, it looked academic to me, so I put it out there and the professor says, uh, this, is, this is not something I wanna see in a bibliography, where did I go wrong? Well, some things you have to look for, qualifications of the author, sometimes you have to Google the author, uh, find out, you know, do they have academic credentials, do they have a professional reputation if they published other things, um, evidence of a lack of bias, when you go through good scholarship, you're not going to see one point of view that ignores every other point of view. That's not good scholarship. Good scholarship uh, looks at multiple points of view. Even if it supports one of those points of view, it's fair to everything that has any merit in making the argument. And it tells the truth in the broadest sense. Uh, you can... You can have a great bibliography, but you can misrepresent people. You can slant evidence. Uh, you can make it so that one thing looks like this when it should look at that. And if you want to see examples of this, just talk, listen to the, uh, the average politician talk. Uh, all of them, no matter what party, tend to slant whatever reality they are dealing with to support whatever position they want to support. And you say, well, yeah, you, you could say that, but, you know, it's not really fair to say so and so. Well, that's using good critical thinking. It isn't fair when you're trying to present one point of view. Now, how many of you, and uh, 
Well, I'm just going to do this and then we'll, we'll have some discussion. Uh, I've got some activities over here. If you want to pursue this more, if you want to actually, uh, you know, take a look at this, or if you want cer certification from the Catholic Distance Learning Network, uh, what you can do is go through these exercises here. Uh, it doesn't have to be very long, you know, a couple of pages. Uh, answer these questions or do these tasks, and then click on this thing, which is a, uh, a document uh, template. And uh, you can download that template, fill in the blanks with your information here, and send it to me. My email is there as an attachment, and I will, I will go through it. And um, then I can add to your certification claim. Uh, but I want to get out of here, stop my share, and here I am back here. Uh, how many of you are at least moderately concerned about the flow of crazy information out there in our world today? How many of you are just like, oh boy, I don't know where all this is going. And, you know, it used to be that crazy belonged to a fringe. We've always had the crazy fins. You know, we called them uh, cults if we didn't like them or new religious movements if we did. And, uh, you know, they were, they were out there. There have always been people who are way out there. And you may have friends who, uh, you know, they, they saw Elvis at the gas station, you know, kind of thing. Uh, and uh, I have friends like that too. But this is becoming mainstream where there are, People who are, uh, in essence, they have denied uh, the validity of scientific data. They have denied the, lip, lo, uh, uh, the validity of authority in the sense of, of government and scientific authority. And they are operating on the level of opinion. And now, how do you unravel all this? How do you speak to people? who are saying things that you think are just like crazy, you know, and dangerous crazy. Um, I uh, added a chapter to the latest edition of my textbook. It's Appendix B. And I suggest you have a look at it uh, that tries to unravel, you know, some of the crazy and why, it, why it's happening, what's going on out there. But it's become a real rallying point, I think, for each of us to make a decision and the decision is essentially this. We have had authority structures over the decades and years. And uh, I mean, the Catholic Church uh, has decades and centuries of authority structures in place. And sometimes those get challenged. Uh, sometimes they get questioned. But, you know, nobody kind of overturns the apple cart and says, OK, we're going to go a different way. Uh, the Reformation tried to do that but they develop their own authority structures. And uh, in some ways they kind of run parallel, you know, the, the belief systems are, are different, but they're using the same scriptures essentially. And so uh, those kinds of structures existed. And we have the option today to upset the apple cart and say, we will not believe any of that stuff anymore. We will believe the voices that are speaking most loudly to us the voices that are warning us of the grand conspiracies in life that are threatening us in every possible way, we will trust that. We will not trust the so-called, and I always love that, so-called, quotation marks, authorities in our lives. They've constructed their own method of authority, but it is a dangerous path. You know, when I look at uh, areas of the country that are unvaccinated, and the number of deaths are going up incrementally, no exponentially. Uh, the number of deaths are going up, even as those are the regions where people are not being vaccinated. And when the authority structures say over 99% of COVID deaths now in the United States are among unvaccinated people, you know, if I was following scientific evidence, and if I was at least some way listening to what the government had to say, I would say, whoa, this is serious. This is something I need to obey. And the question really comes into our whole area of research. To what extent are we going to trust the knowledge base of the discipline, uh, the, the authority figures in the discipline, 
And to what extent are we going to challenge them at every turn and try to upset everything? And, you know, my view is this knowledge base has grown over centuries. You know, think of, think of tradition. The Catholic tradition grew up over centuries. Uh, it developed in very rigorous kinds of ways. You know, it didn't just, you know, get dumped in there. And, you know, it'd be kind of foolish now uh, as a newcomer to this, to this world to say, oh, well, you know, all of that stuff's old. I, I don't want to trust any of that anymore. It has authority. It has structure. And even when you might question some of it, challenge some of it, there might be some debates about how do we interpret this or that. Uh, there's, there's lots of room in biblical interpretation for all kinds of questions to be asked, even theological interpretation. And theologians debate stuff. I mean, uh, look at liberation theologians, you know, they, uh, they, they challenge lots of stuff, you know. And so as we, as we look at all of this, we got to think it's the role of scholarship to question and to challenge, but it is also the role of scholarship to trust the knowledge base to be fundamentally correct and to recognize that if I am going to challenge the knowledge base in any particular way, I am going to have to have good reasons and I am going to have to be open to having people challenge me, right? As soon as you put yourself out there and challenge anything, people will challenge you. Uh, I remember the, the New Testament scholar C.H. Dodd, who was an innovator. Uh, he, was, he was a gentle rebel. Now, he was not a radical in the sense of like way out there. Um, you know, he was, but he had some ideas. Uh, for one thing, he, uh, he looked at the, uh, the preaching in the, in the book of Acts, and they realized that a lot of it was quite chronologically. It went chronological, went through the life of Jesus, uh, you know, as the, as the various apostles were preaching. They, they talked about the life of Jesus and uh, then his crucifixion, his resurrection. And Dodd said, you know, those speeches actually are echoed in the structure of the Gospels. The way in which the Gospel of Mark is structured is very similar to what Peter may have said in Acts 3. And so what Dodd argued was that it's quite possible that the gospel writers built their structure, their outline for the gospels on the gospel preaching. So they had a pattern of preaching that told the story of Jesus, and that pattern ended up being the structure of the gospels. Now, there's nothing radical about that. Both of them were, were telling truth. You know, the structure of the preaching was this, was telling the story of Jesus, and so are the Gospels. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a novel idea, but it really, really makes sense. And you could show the parallels that the Gospels rose out of the preaching. And uh, so uh, Dodd put this forward and immediately got challenged. And uh, D.E. Nynum wrote a blistering uh, article challenging Dodd. But, you know, that's the essence of scholarship. When you do come up with new ideas, when you do come up with a proposed solution, someone will challenge you. But that's how the knowledge grows. And, you know, if you think of research in those terms as problem solving, as advancing, as, you know, looking at how we can move forward and build the knowledge base, then you've got something really exciting. And um, I, was, I was just telling a, a group of uh, professors at Holy Apostles, about a student I had uh, who uh, was writing a paper on St. Patrick. And he came to me, he said, everybody's written on St. Patrick, right? I mean, you got a church history paper, you know, right on, on Patrick, right? Uh, brilliant, you know, it's easy to do. Uh, and there's, there's stuff you can, you can do. And he said, I, I don't want to write on St. Patrick, but I, but I do. And he said, you know, I've, I've discovered that a number of, uh, church leaders in Northern uh, Europe, mainland Europe, France and Germany, and, uh, traveled to Ireland to study what Patrick was doing with his evangelism of the people. And uh, the people, when Patrick got there, were essentially non-Christian for the most part, and they had some tremendous success. Uh, and then they, these, these people went back to mainland Europe with his methods. Uh, he said, I want to explore 
what happened when they went back to Europe? Was it ultimately successful or was Patrick's methodology only useful in that one setting? Now he's got a question and a problem and he's looking, he's evaluating success. So, you know, that's, that's not easy. And, uh, you know, did, did the methodology actually work or not? And so he wrote a really brilliant paper on this. And uh, I thought, great, it's problem-based. He's, he's on a quest. He's trying to figure something out that could be meaningful to church history. Uh, you know, were, were Patrick's methods just, just localized or, um, or were, did they have, you know, widespread significance? Would they have significance even today? And uh, so on. And so uh, there it is. Now, do you have questions as we uh, move on through this? We've mainly looked at the information landscape today, and it's probably more disturbing than you wanted to even think about. But we have to think about this, and we have to think about it in terms of what is scholarly and what is not, or we're sunk from the beginning. Any questions? Yes, James. You're muted. There we are. Oh, I'm a uh, philosophy I'm in the philosophy program at, at Holy Apostles. And I've done a lot of legal research in the past. And I, so I thought I knew about research, but it's a whole new ball game uh, with philosophy. It seems un, so unbounded and so wide open. When I was doing legal research, it's easy. You, you could go to Shepherds or you go online and you can read what yeah. one court said about this case and find yeah. out what every other court in the country said about that case. And you've got a very you, specific you, problem. Yeah, you had covered everything. I have no idea how to find the assurance that I've covered everything that needs to be covered in a particular topic in philosophy. Yeah, philosophy is essentially problem-based. Uh, you've got uh, the question of the problem of evil. Um, you've got the question of uh, uh, free will. And what I think you have to do uh, is whatever topic you're dealing with, boil it down to one essential question that philosophy has asked. Um, in other words, uh, theodicy, uh, um, how can we explain evil? You know, uh, or what is the origin of evil? Uh, you know, if you're looking at, at free will, do human beings actually have free will? And uh, I think I'd probably challenge that because uh, we are under so many influences. But anyways, uh, what I would do is crystallize it down to one question that you know other philosophers have asked. It doesn't have to be a new question because how many new questions are there in philosophy? I don't know. Uh, but uh, boil it down to one question. Make it really concise because of the breadth of philosophy, you can get yourself snared into, you know, so much stuff. And uh, so I would find one current issue that, uh, you know, has been debated and, and really crystallize it. And uh, once you do that, you can see, you can set the boundaries yourself. You can say, you know, this is what we're going to do. And we're, you know, we're not going to consider the, this other stuff. Uh, this is what we're going to do. Set your boundaries narrowly. Because most problem solving has to have narrow boundaries. Uh, you want to go deep. And uh, the broader you go, the less deep you can go. Any other questions? Oh, Bill, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so would you say that the, the research process is one of moderation in some ways? Because I look at the, the model of a conspiracy theory, and it seems like a really toxic combination of blind trust in authority, maybe not the right authority, and extreme skepticism like you were talking about. Would yeah. you say that it's a, a moderation approach? Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I I think if if we're going to be doing research and we're not going to be in that world, uh, that world is built in midair, by the way. It has no foundation to it. Uh, the foundation is what I believe in my heart to be true, which is a really, really crummy foundation. It's, it's built in midair. Uh, and so you got to get your feet on the ground. Uh, you've got to be working with stuff that has been tested out by other scholars, uh, material that's been asserted and checked and rechecked. And um, 
you know, uh, find the best resources, uh, the resources where scholars have had the stuff peer reviewed, where other scholars have commented on it. Um, and, you know, if you want to have some questions about that, what you can do is, is uh, track uh, the, the footnotes and, and bibliography of the authors that the authors used. Uh, you can also go to Google Scholar. If you look up a particular article and you want to say what, what happened, how did people treat this, uh, underneath it, you'll have uh, a, a list, a, a number of citations to that particular article. And those are other people that made reference to it. And you can track that down and see what they thought of that particular article and whether they accepted it. And uh, generally, if there's a thousand citations, it means the article's pretty good or it's so awfully bad that everybody wanted a note to say, in passing to say, you know, don't trust so-and-so, uh, <laughs> which, which can also happen. Uh, but uh, so there are ways of, of kind of vetting things and making sense of them, but uh, don't build your foundation in midair. Um, if you can't substantiate with some kind of data, scientific, historical, uh, scholarly data, or scholars have been at work here, um, then you, you're not going to get anywhere in, in higher education because it just it just goes nowhere. Any other questions? I have one actually. Yeah. Um, and I kind of, I recognize that this might not be completely pertinent to scholarly and academic research, but yeah. I noticed today um, one of our big sources of getting information is videos. So whether yeah. it be YouTube or whether it be whatever. So what in your opinion would be a good level of how you would expect someone to cite information or cite their sources on a video as opposed to, because um, people, we know what we're looking for about videos. Yeah. Often, often they don't. And what I would look for there is, is the authority of whoever is presenting the material. So does it come out of an organization that you trust? You know, uh, if, if it's a, a video from the Mayo Clinic on some medical thing, uh, you can say, uh, yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're good folks. Uh, they're, they're reliable. Or if it's a, you know, a fairly famous theologian um, doing a, presenting a video on something, uh, you can say, yeah, you know, that's, that's got some credibility to it. Um, but uh, videos very often uh, don't cite what they're doing. So you have to look at the credibility of whoever's putting it out. And that's really the only way you can evaluate it. I guess on that yeah. front there, I mean, can you cite video at all then, right? Because you have to have something yeah. to go back to. I, I wouldn't want to say absolutely you can't. Because, uh, you know, uh, if it was sort of uh, Raymond Brown, the famous New Testament scholar, if he put, put on his video, uh, you know, my, my perceptions of the Gospel of John, you've got a guy here who spent, you know, 50 years studying the Gospel of John. Okay. And uh, now he puts out this video, my perception. Uh, I, I wouldn't have a problem with including that because it's, it's based on enough experience and enough authority that you can say, um, you know, yeah, it's Raymond Brown. Like who's going to challenge him, you know? Uh, so uh, I would really have a look at, you know, other kinds of things by way of credibility. I was just getting, thinking along the lines of like Bishop Barron's publications. Yeah. In, in every case, you just have to do whatever evaluation you can do. Um, it just, um, you, you have to kind of make sense of who is the person, what are they saying? And, um, you know, the kind of credibility has to be, has to be measured. Okay, Sebastian is uh, signaling us furiously here that we've run out of time. Uh, we will have time next week. I hope this is of some value to you. Uh, we're just beginning. And uh, next week, we'll take a look at research design, how to set up your research for success. Thank you, Professor Badke. Um, Brother Jason has, a, uh, has agreed to close us in a prayer. Brother Jason. Okay. Yep. So, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
I uh, just want to thank you, Lord, for uh, the opportunity today for all of us to gather here and uh, benefit from uh, Professor Badke's uh, research. Thank you, Lord, um, for his continued healing. I pray for everyone on the call who is uh, currently active in research and looking towards research. Uh, enlighten our minds and hearts. In the name of the, well, in your son's holy name, we pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jason. All right, everybody, see you back. Uh, same uh, time, uh, same Zoom link uh, next Thursday. And Thank God you, bless. everyone. Thank you. Okay. The mission of Holy Apostles College and Seminary is to form faithful witnesses of Christ. Year after year, the prestigious Newman Guide has recommended Holy Apostles for our academic excellence and steadfast fidelity to the magisterial teachings of the Catholic Church. We are also fully accredited and the leader in Catholic online learning. Our students enjoy the unsurpassed flexibility to study on their own time and anywhere in the world through asynchronous engagement. Holy Apostles is dedicated to the relentless pursuit of truth, which allows students in all academic programs, including undergraduate, graduate, and personal interest, to formulate a coherent worldview based on both faith and reason. The study of the liberal arts also develops and refines key competencies associated with career readiness, such as critical thinking and problem solving, clear communication, collaboration, and a strong work ethic. The tuition rate at Holy Apostles is one of the most affordable in the country. Yearly tuition for a full-time undergraduate is under $12,000. Students at Holy Apostles can graduate with minimal or even no college debt, which enables them to live out their calling as faithful witnesses of Christ without heavy financial burdens holding them back. Please visit www.holyapostles.edu forward slash admissions for more information. The fall 2021 admissions deadline is Friday, July 23rd. Classes start Monday, August 30th. See you soon. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.